Today I decided to dive deeper than anybody has done when it comes to the dangers of the internet to kids. And to do so, I talked to a Harvard doctor. And I'm also gonna interview two moms that lost their kids to the hidden dangers of social media. As a parent, I failed. The grief, the pain, it's always there. I found my daughter dead the next day. There's a whole bunch of regret. Social media just needs to be safer. And since you're probably watching this while scrolling on your phone or procrastinating at work or school, I'll make it easy for you to pay attention. So here's some entertainment on the side. So as someone who in a way does make a living monetizing your attention, I wanted to know, should and will the government do something? What are these hidden dangers of social media for kids and parents alike? And by the end, I'll see if there's anything that we can do to solve this crisis. So let's start by asking parents who unfortunately lost their kids to the internet. Thanks for joining. If you could just kind of tell me who you are and what your story is. My name is Misty. My story is, is that I had a 17 year old daughter. She purchased a uh, counterfeit via Snapchat and the next morning I found her deceased in her room. Since then I've been raising awareness on the dangers of counterfeit pills and social media with kids and social media harms in general. Do you know any other parents who have been going through a very similar situation as yours? Oh yeah, our stories are all very, very similar. My name's Amy Neville, and I am the president of the Alexander Neville Foundation. The foundation came to be after we lost our 14-year-old son, Alexander, to fentanyl poisoning the summer of 2020. Alexander had had a funky few days in June of 2020. I asked him, like, what's going on, dude? I even asked him if he was using something, and he said no. But he did come back to us, and he said, okay, I got to talk to you guys. You know, he said, I wanted to experiment with Oxy. I got it from a dealer on Snapchat. It has a hold on me, and I don't know why. I called the treatment place. He came home, he went to bed, and sometime after 9 o'clock, he took the pill that took his life. Like, death was not on the radar. Is this something like a regret that you kind of live with every day? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how could I have known? Like, what could I have said after my daughter took that pill was, did she know something was wrong? Like, was she scared to come and tell me? And so she just went to sleep. There will always be a sense of regret, right? My number one job in life is to protect my kids. And as a parent, I failed. <clears throat> so it's... Um, so that's, that, that's always there, right? The, the grief, the, the, the pain, the missing him, it's always there. So yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of regret. I just, social media just needs to be safer. That's really the bottom line. So what would you say are like the biggest dangers to the kids and the internet today? Definitely the, the, the drug situation. Everybody always thinks not my kid. You know, there's not a drug problem in my house, so I don't have to listen to this messaging. But the reality is drop that stigma, whatever that we think we used to know about the war on drugs, drop that. These kids weren't out at a party. They weren't out running the streets. They weren't, you know, they weren't doing those things. These kids were on social media obtaining counterfeit pills. It, social media has changed the game. And so we'll come back to this because just a few months ago, 60 parents launched a lawsuit against Snap. Claiming their children died after taking illegal drugs sold by dealers on the app. When it comes to the internet and kids, it's not just parents that are taking action now. One of the country's largest adult entertainment websites has now been shut down here in Texas. Texas sued Pornhub, accusing them of not following Texas law, of checking users' ages properly, and keeping minors from accessing bad content. And in response, they decided to block access to the site in Texas altogether. And just as I'm making this video, Florida just announced that they'll be banning social media for kids under 14. And so now even governments are taking action. Being buried in those devices all day is not the best way to grow up. It's not the best way to get a good education. But is this all just a bit extreme or between stories like Misty and Amy and past events that's happened, does this make sense? Because when we go back to 2015, a game started circulating around the internet where it involved teenagers completing 50 dangerous challenges in 50 days. Yeah, so a bunch of teens doing challenges, yeah, that's that's never go right. <laughs> the game's Russian creator himself aimed to cleanse society. So what exactly was the challenge? The first few facts included waking up in the middle of the night and watching a scary movie. But here's where things take a dark turn because day by day, the task grew more and more dangerous. Participants had to poke themselves with a needle, climb cranes, cut themselves, and then on the final day, it's called the Blue Whale Challenge, and it's getting kids to hurt themselves and then post pictures and even videos of them doing it. The Blue Whale Challenge led 130 children to unalive themselves, and when similar games like Momo Challenge has also occurred in the past, it makes you think. That one, kids are obviously easily influenced, but also the fact that people can influence someone at this level from anywhere in the world. The other thing too is there's the choking challenges out there. You know, our kids are not necessarily seeking these choking challenges, but they show 
show up in their For You feed, they engage with the video, they watch the video, and then over time they get bored and decide to try it one day or somebody dares them to try it through social media and next thing you know they're doing these things. So like again, even if it's just a subway surfer, hopefully I'm keeping your attention at this point. Because when this is my job, obviously I'm gonna be biased. I'm not gonna be some boomer that says that we should ban social media or internet altogether. And so instead I wanted to bring in an expert from Harvard who way smarter than you or I, and who's also technically a boomer, what his thoughts are on this issue. I am uh, Michael Rich. I am a pediatrician. I'm the founding director of the Digital Wellness Lab and the Clinic for Interactive Media and, and Internet Disorders. What is an impact on a media today on kids that isn't that commonly known? I think an impact is that they live in a larger world than kids ever have before. They, they have access to virtually anybody, anywhere, at any time, which is phenomenal as an educational tool, but is potentially worrisome because they can wander anywhere. So they need to be informed and empowered to make the right choices for them in that environment. What platform has caused the most problems. We don't look at it that way. We look at it as what what uses of these platforms is, is more or less um, harmful. Well, I think that algorithms that lead you to negative places. Say a young person is interested in being healthy. They go online, they look up being healthy, that gets equated to being thin, that gets equated to eating less, and they go down the rabbit hole of an eating disorder. Teach them critical thinking by bringing some cognitive dissonance in. And to be honest, I can relate, man. I, I've been watching like a lot of shorts recently, and I always feel so guilty after these binge sessions, and maybe it's just my ADHD, but do any of you guys ever remember a short that you've watched? Like if you watch shorts today, try and remember one short that you've watched. Come on, right? Like that can't be good for our brains. Because whenever I'm watching shorts all the time, I've noticed that it's making it harder for me to focus on my work or my craft. Where even in these interviews that you've seen so far, there's been some instances where my mind is completely wandering when I should be fucking listening. But like, look, I'm 27, so I did grow up in an age where I knew a life without iPads, but now you see these 13 year olds growing up and all they know is being an iPad kid. And I swear it's the saddest shit seeing that when you're at like a restaurant and you see these kids buried in their iPad with their parents looking all stressed and tired, but also happy that they finally shut up. But anyways, before we get back to what happened with Snap, I wanna do a little bit of an experiment and see what it's like to be a 14 year old iPad kid today. And so to do that, I'm going to create a TikTok account and put my age as 14 to simulate the type of content that I'll get at that age. I actually saw this article where it's essentially saying how TikTok, within 30 minutes of joining the platform, it started showing content like eating disorders and self-harm to people as young as 13. Am I too depressed to eat? Yes, but two weeks? 10 pounds off. It doesn't matter how young you are, it's going to start just pushing content that's gonna get you to stick to that platform. So I'm gonna start creating a new uh, account here. Okay, so I'm just going to sign up. So what would 14 years old be? I guess since the 2020, wow, 2010. That's wild to think about. I was born in 97, so. <sighs> So now I've been swiping for around like 30 minutes or so. Yeah, I can now see what's what's going on. It started showing a bunch of girls, but now it's really just, that's the only thing that they're showing. It's just a bunch of thirst trap from, from girls that I think a 14 year old kid would like. The reason why I wanna actually do this though is because I saw this video that essentially breaks down TikTok's crazy terms of service. Broken down here by Joe Rogan. This is uh, from TikTok's privacy policy. We collect certain information about the device you use to access the platform, your IP address, identifiers for advertising purpose, device IDs, keystroke patterns or rhythms. So they're monitoring your keystrokes which means they know every thing you type. Wow. TikTok isn't like the only one that might be potentially selling their information, right? In fact, we know Meta, Google, all these different platforms are selling the data, right? That's the only reason why it's free. And what they do is they actually sell it to data brokers who will sell it to spammers, scammers, or literally anyone that wants data of these people who use the platform. But whether you're a 14 year old kid or someone my age who actively uses these platforms, you can see how much like weird data out there is of you that 
you may never even know that you gave up. So enough playing a 14 year old kid on TikTok. Now what I wanna do is to Google myself. So let's do this quick search, right? I'm just gonna search up my name. So obviously for me, it makes sense that a lot of this information is public, but I'm willing to bet you probably see like your email, phone number, home address, like all out there on Google. So since I use the internet all the time and I'm giving out my data, that's why I use Aura, today's sponsor for this video. So Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. So as you can see on my Aura account, these are all the data brokers that were selling my information and using it. So cleaning up on my info obviously cuts down on the spam that I get, but more importantly, it shields me from hackers that could swipe my details and break into my social media, which is my job, bank accounts, or other private stuff. Plus, considering how chronically online kids are these days, Aura can also protect you and your family. It's got parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, and an identity theft insurance all in one so you don't need to have a bunch of apps and subscriptions. So as we're gonna talk about in this next part of the video, now more than ever, our privacy is so important. So you can go to aura.com slash again in my link in the description to start your two week free trial. So enough Googling myself and playing some 14 year old kid because as they've shared, is it becoming harder and harder to keep kids safe online, especially with apps like Snap? Essentially, your daughter um, was connected to a drug dealer through Snapchat. Who do you blame for what happened? I absolutely blame Snapchat. You know, uh, they are very aware of what their platform is doing and they're not taking any accountability. They're not working with us to try and make it a safer platform. This increase in drugs to our adolescents, I blame on Snapchat. They are the largest opener drug market in existence, especially when it comes to our adolescents. And they've chose to sweep it under the rug rather than educate the communities about it or put out real warnings about harms on their platforms or hey parents you should be looking out for these things as we did so i'm sure everybody knows but snapchat is an app that gained a lot of popularity mainly due to their disappearing message and photos and growing up too it was obviously popular amongst young kids because now parents can't really see the message that you're sending and receiving and as discussed one of the biggest risks that children face on snapchat is just how easy it is to get in contact with strangers and so with that snapchat essentially became a gateway for abuse and sextortion it's sad to look at an entire banner full of all of these children's faces that are no longer with us, all from Snapchat. They're all Snapchat cases. But parents are not taking a stand. In late 2023, parents of 60 teenagers sue Snapchat, alleging it had facilitated their children's drug acquisition, resulting in overdoses. But that's not the only legal problem that Snapchat has. In 2020, a Virginian man was sentenced to 50 years in prison and used Snapchat as a tool for his crimes. He even used a different alias on Snapchat to hide his identity. But that's not all because there's countless stories of these predators using Snapchat as that tool or gateway. What are some specific changes you want Snapchat to make? We just want them to be aware of what's happening, make it safe. You know, after my daughter passed away, I reached out to Snapchat immediately, letting them know, hey, we need to get into her Snapchat. This is what happened. To this day, even with police involvement, Snapchat has not responded. They're not interested. Remove this drug content, remove these dealers, but preserve it at the same time. They need to be more proactive in that and they need to be more thorough all of these online companies need to have a duty of care. And what I mean by that is, so for example, if I had a hotel and there was a sex trafficking ring in my hotel and I knew about it and I didn't do anything about it, I would be held accountable for that. It's out of control. And, and we're, we're the fallout from that. And as we discussed earlier, governments are now starting to crack down on this issue of internet and kids' safety. But at the same time, should these governments be interfering with these platforms and potentially violate free speech? So what are some specific examples, like let's say if you were part of the government, right? What role would you want to play to stop playing defense and being, I guess, more on the offensive regarding them? I think we have to understand that the um, shared interactive media space, the internet, is our new town square, if you will. And so we have to develop a, a level of transparency about how it works and the ways that information passes and what kind of information passes. We have to figure out how we want our levels of privacy to be. It's too easy now for kids in particular, but for all of us to go negative, um, to be edgier and to divide us more. And we have this immensely powerful tool that can connect us and bind us together. And yet we're often using it to push each other away. And even though it takes years for governments to catch up to these types of things, there's a lot more attention now. Because in January, as covered in our free weekly newsletter, link in bio, CEOs of big social media companies were summoned to a hearing, but why? 
CEOs of Meta, TikTok, Discord, X, and Snap all appeared in front of senators over these child safety concerns. And it shows that it's not just Misty and Amy and Snapchat, but all these platforms were being accused of exploiting teens and their mental health. And low key, Zuck was getting cooked. 37% of teenage girls between 13 and 15 were exposed to unwanted nudity in a week on Instagram. You knew about it. Who did you fire? Senator, this is why we're building all Who these did you fire? Tools. Senator, that's, I don't think that that's... Who did you fire? And I promise you that I'll talk about this at the end of the video, but Zuck was getting pressed about the underage kids on Instagram, as well as drug deaths linked to both Instagram and Facebook. And not to mention being asked about the multiple lawsuits against Meta for having features specifically designed to keep kids addicted and watching countless reel after reel without remembering shit. So what are your thoughts on the recent like Senate hearing with like the big tech CEOs from Discord, Meta, and then importantly, Snap? I think that Mark Zuckerberg getting up and stating multiple times that there's no direct correlation between mental health issues and social media it was crazy. I can't believe he, he even said that. I mean, everybody knows that's not the case anymore. And then you've got Evan Spiegel out there saying that, yes, he supports the Cooper Davis Act, and yes, he supports the Kids Online Safety Act, but yet taking no action to implement any of that. So, you know, he needs to implement that now. I mean, it's good to see, right? Like, we have to talk about it. So for me, as a parent, like, yes, I'm glad that there is conversation that's happening. I just want action behind it. I think that mm. it is, like I said, it is good that we're talking about it, but there is so much that needs to be done to make it safer. I think it is unfortunate that we have polarized this argument to the point where they feel they have to legislate against the tech companies as opposed to figuring out ways to help work the system to make it a more useful, um, healthy system. And look, there's been countless of these Senate hearings so far with nothing happening, but this time was a little bit different because something unexpected happened. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? As you can see, he directly apologized to the parents, but is that good enough? Because just like Snap, his platform is at least part of the reason why these children died. But as we do on this channel, I'm, I'm gonna play the devil's advocate. Because are these kids' deaths really the platform's fault? Or is it also the parents? If I may like respectfully play the devil's advocate though, in that instance, is that really the platform's fault? Or in that instance, was it more so the culpability on the drug dealer? It does seem like Snap was kind of like the medium in which they communicated. Absolutely, and we're not saying Snapchat's all to blame at all. What we're saying is, is you have a responsibility with this platform. If you know that this is taking place, why not work together to make it a safer place? We're saying we need to make it safer for the kids that are on the platform. You know, that's, that's it. You can use it responsibly. I understand that. However, we have a whole drug epidemic that's happening right now and our kids are dying and they're using Snapchat to obtain those pills. It's not Snapchat's fault my daughter died. The problem is, is we're coming to you and we're saying, hey, we need help making these changes to make these children safe and stop kids from dying because they're using your app. The kind of popular vernacular these days is to say that social media is like the root of all evil. Where do you stand on that? I'm not one of those parents that's trying to get rid of social media. I know that's not a re realistic expectation, okay? I, I'm fully, I fully get that. And I myself use social media, right? I mean, it, it's connected me to family I haven't seen in years and years and years, yeah. you know? But if you look at the rise in mental health issues, it rises at the, at the same rate as social media. So there, there, we know there's a direct correlation. It's very human and frankly, very lazy to seek a bind binary answer to a complex and nuanced question. This idea that if we only got rid of smartphones, if we only got rid of social media, everything would be okay. Well, guess what? All of these trends of increasing anxiety, increasing depression, things of that nature, were already in place. Do social media amplify and accelerate things? Absolutely. And those are the things that we can work on with the algorithm. But I think that um, we've got to step back and say, what kind of world do we want to live in? How do these tools fit into that? And how do I 
personally clean up my own space in ways that I want to see others do it. Because I hear this all the time of how social media is the cause of everything bad. Because isn't it a bit of a lazy excuse to just blame these platforms when clearly this issue is a lot more complex? And yeah, yeah, I'm biased because this is my job, shut up. But in all seriousness, when do we start looking at the individual and how they also use it? Because one way to look at it is that technology like social media is like a tool, right? And just how you can use it to feed you brain rot content, you can also have it feed you valuable information and content like my video and also connect you to people from around the world. Like that's powerful. But at the same time, we do have to remember that we're talking about kids that are easily impressionable. And so when we talk about technology, what happens when tech companies start pushing their own agenda and influence through what we see. Because this might be something that I don't think people are talking about enough when it comes to AI and how it can start influence. Researchers who developed Imagen in 2020 warned that AI could harm by spreading misinformation, but also could start excluding communities. Like here, take a look at this prompt and then what was generated after. And so obviously not historically accurate in that a group of Nazi soldiers were shown as people of color. And then let's take a look at this another example here. Okay, hold up. Why does bro kind of look like me in 30 years? <laughs> so I doubt any US senators in the 1800s was Asian. I was probably building railroads and shit. And this diverse choice that was rolled out by Gemini was noticed by a lot of people, including this former employee of Google. So since then, Google has apologized for what it describes as inaccuracies in some historical image generation depictions. In supporting that, one might say that this is just an overcorrection of AI's long-standing racial biases. So look, I think it is a bit extreme to just say that AI is now gonna start erasing history, but most importantly, what this shows is how technology has has the potential now more and more to increasingly influence us in how we see the world. So then, what the hell can we even do? If you could leave a message to every parent out there on how to handle their kids' online activity, what would it be? Follow the things that they're following. Make it a rule that they have to follow positive content too. You know, they can follow groups like um, our foundation or other groups out there that, that are doing drug prevention education, get them to follow those things. Phones have no place in the dining room. They have no place in the bedroom at, at nighttime. There are a lot of things, but it, it's less about individual rules than it is about the expectations we have for each other. And what are they? That, they, that we be present for each other, that we not be staring at our phones when we're with each other, et cetera. Talk to your kids, be open and honest with them. They know so much more than we think that they do. Kids are scared to talk to their parents because they're afraid they're going to be in trouble, you know? And so if we give these kids a safe space to talk about things like this, we might be able to find out more of what we need to know. But sometimes it's the parents themselves that are putting their child in danger. A disturbing investigation led by the New York Times looked into the world of underage modeling on social media, where moms are the ones posting, let's say, bad photos of their daughters as young as eight on Instagram just for some extra followers and money in the bank. You can already guess the type of people that these pictures and accounts are attracting. And it's not like these parents don't know. So we can't even trust the parents or the platforms or the kids. Are we cooked when it comes to technology? They're not doing enough right now. And again, we keep hearing these empty promises. It's gonna take legislation, to lawsuits and legislation to really move the needle on any of this. And so we have to get through that long haul first. I'm gonna be honest, if we don't see some very, very serious changes, I don't see it getting any better. Now that it's out there and now that it can be used in this manner, why would they stop? Social media will go on. I hope that it improves all the time. I think there will always be bad actors because we're human. There are always going to be people who will figure out ways to exploit e each other either for profit or just for pleasure. We do have to educate and empower young people to both protect themselves and each other from harm on the outside, but also be producing because this is now media are not just a receptive thing anymore. And so I think what the point is, is that no matter you're a gen alpha or a boomer, just like a bad diet, what you regularly consume is going to impact how you think, how you see the world and what you put out into the world. And it's something that made me think because ever since I've gone full time to build the next big middle ground media company, I have to be honest, I don't think I'm going towards a good path. Just like Amy and Misty would say that these platforms are only after maximizing profits over kids' safety, as corny as it may sound, 
I feel like I've been doing something similar, but chasing views over impact. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot because if I honestly and genuinely want to inspire others to consider other perspectives and help us change how society approaches issues, if I'm the one compromising on my values, there's no shot will even get closer to our mission because just like this video explored whether we like it or not there's no denying it just like how you're watching this online from anywhere in the world change starts online and my aim is to inspire not damage the next generation and if you agree help us by signing up to our free weekly newsletter bridging the bias to join our mission of changing the way people approach issues or you can just watch this next video here